Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest ALTA Insights webinar. I'm Jeremy Yowie, ALTA's Vice President of Communications, and uh, today we've got a, a great presentation lined up uh, to discuss the type of leadership, leadership skills that are essential in today's uh, work environment. Uh, before starting, we uh, always need to touch on a few housekeeping items. Um, today's webinar is being recorded. You'll get an email with a link to the recording tomorrow. And you can always access all of our webinar recordings at alta.org forward slash webinars. Uh, this email that you'll get tomorrow will also include a link to download a copy of today's presentation. And in the meantime, um, you can also access the in the handout section you, in the go to webinar window pane, you can download a copy of the presentation now. Um, if at any time you do have a question, submit them in the questions box. We'll hold a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. Uh, we do need to thank SoftPro for sponsoring today's uh, Insights presentation. And before I introduce uh, today's speaker, I do have a commercial from SoftPro. Thank you, SoftPro. Let me uh, click a few buttons here and get the PowerPoint back up. I'm terrible at talking and clicking buttons. All right. Um, thank you, SoftPro, as I mentioned. Uh, let me uh, introduce today's speaker now. Uh, we have Steve, Steve Rudolph. He uh, actually did give a presentation uh, for us a couple years ago. Actually, uh, maybe three years ago. It's been a while. Wow. Um, uh, Steve Rudolph uh, uh, is a leadership coach expert. Uh, he grew up in the uh, restaurant business. Sorry, I got distracted because my slide doesn't have his name on it. That's weird. There we go. <laughs> uh, as I said, he grew up in the restaurant business. He, he learned how to manage and lead people in, in high pressure environment. And as a successful restaurant owner, uh, Steve developed his business and his strategic acumen making him a, a trusted advisor to leaders and managers. His uh, clients uh, include companies in title, healthcare, uh, and restaurant industries, among others. And uh, I thought I'd also mention, uh, with the Olympics currently taking place, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, uh, uh, mention his work with the U.S. Paralympic team. He's uh, guided um, two visually impaired Nordic skiers in two Olympics. So, uh, Steve, I don't know if maybe you want to, share a little bit of insight on that it's pretty you know interesting and timely before we get into to leadership i imagine some of that actually involves a little leadership and you know trust between both yeah jeremy uh, it's funny you bring that up one story that i've got a lot of cr crazy stories as you could imagine there's three categories of visual impairments in the olympics um there's high partial which is kind of like legally blind low partial and then and then total 100 percent blind and I guided uh, athletes that were 100% totally blind. They had no visual recognition at all. And, uh, and the, fun, the amazing thing is the race courses that we skied on were the same race courses used by the regular bodied Olympic team. So it's not like, oh, you've got a bunch of visually impaired people. We're going to put you out in the cornfield where, you know, nothing can third uphill, third downhill, third flat through trees. I mean, it was crazy nuts. And, but I remember one time, I was uh, competing 
uh, for the national team in Lake Tahoe. And I'm with uh, my visually impaired athlete and I'm up front. You know, there's two types of cross country skiing. There's the classic, like you're walking, you probably know that. And then there's the skate skiing where they, you know, they, they push off on each side if you watch the Olympics. And we were skate skiing, we we're going up this long hills, like maybe close to three um, quarter mile long, but it was a beast of a hill. And I'm up front and you have to just, you, you have to talk nonstop as a guy. It's a 30 kilometer race, which is 18 miles. And I'm going, come on, John, come on, up, 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 constantly talking. And John says to me, my athlete, he says, how much further do we have to go, Steve? And I said, just a little bit left. Come on, John, you got it. So we go up, 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 we're going, going. And I look back and John's gone. This is Lake Tahoe. There's like cliffs there and things. Well, where did John go? He went just a little left. When he said, how much further? And I said, just a little left. <laughs> oh, no. Literally, so. he hangs on every word. So moral of the story around management, right, is everything we say and do, do mat matters. In leadership and management, we say we're kind of in a fishbowl, right? Everyone's always watching what we say and we do. And there's really nothing neutral that we do or say, folks, out there today, right? As managers, we have kind of this outsized input on people. So we have to be very precise in our language and tone. So that's a little set up for today, but welcome everybody. Um, I'll say just a few words before I talk about this alarming quote here, but I hope everyone's doing okay, uh, all the members out there. We've, it's been a just amazing two years. I hope everyone's health is okay. Jeremy and I were just talking about the pressure on management during COVID continues to be um, helping people navigate their personal lives, um, everyone's lives are different at home, bringing a lot of stress and anxiety. And people are pretty uh, in all different kind of frazzled states, but I hope you're doing well and certainly appreciate the challenges. I'm gonna say a little bit more of my background in a minute, um, as Jeremy mentioned the restaurant business, but I find the restaurant business and the title industry have a lot in common. I've been working with title agencies um, for about the last 10 years. I came in the through Fidelity and uh, continue to work with currently with title agency leaders and their management teams on their leadership management and sales development. But uh, title agency amazes me um, how complex the work is, and yet there's no college degree for it. There's no real certification, right? And if you're lucky, in the, particularly in this tight labor market, it's always been a challenge to find good folks, right? But it's been just so hard, I know, for most of you out there. And even if you find a great, potential person if they don't have any title industry experience but well, it can take 9 12 18 months to get them up to full productivity so it's a very complex job it's fast paced it takes a lot of coordinated interdependent collaborative work amongst the different department areas and there's a high consequence for mistakes right it's a very um you can have a liability exposure very easily and it's a very team oriented environment so i find a lot of it comparable to the restaurant business and I salute you for continuing to lead, manage in a very complex environment and hopefully everyone's doing well. Uh, so this quote, a uh, little tongue in cheek here, but let's just assume you're, you're getting good people in the door, hopefully it all starts with getting great people. As we say, great leadership and coaching can't rearrange someone's DNA or you can't coach to height. You know, if you're five two, you're five two. I can't coach you above five two. Um, but then, you know, what do we know to be true about, you know, money aside, let's say you're paying a competitive rate, salary, base salary, maybe some benefits for your regional operating area. You know, so money off the table. The thing with money, money is a satisfier, but it's not a driver of employee engagement. We know lots of people that are not going to leave a great job, a great boss, a great culture for a buck more an hour. They just don't. If they do, they come back. So we're looking at the controllables. What What's the environment we create as leaders and managers that we know optimize a, uh, an employee's sense of loyalty and passion and dedication and giving that discretionary energy? Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at today, focusing on those controllables. And um, we can advance those slides, Jeremy. Thank you. You can punch right through these. We're going to look at, appreciate that, you know, a coaching style of leadership is really a is a, is a strategy for attracting, engaging, growing, and retaining great people versus a more top-down hierarchical. The modern workforce, millennials, Gen Z coming into the workforce, they expect a much more trans, transparent, much more two-way, much more empowering work environment uh, than maybe some of us that grew up in the old school, the old days. 
Um, and also understand that uh, today's modern workforce, they're looking for employers of choice where there's a, a career pathway where learning, development, growth, and advancement is an opportunity. And that's laid out for folks in the interview process um, in an empowering workforce. And um, we're gonna look at, in our short time together here, those few communication skills that really drive engagement and loyalty. I think it's kind of the 80, 20% rule in management, right? That 20% of your activities lead to 80% of your results. And I think these conversations right here, these feedback conversations, these praise and recognition conversations, quality coaching conversations, that's the 20% of managerial com communications that really lead to high employee engagement, loyalty, and retention. Okay, Jeremy, thank you. So here a little bit of my, uh, more about my restaurant business. This is me when I owned a restaurant. No, this is actually Gordon Ramsay from Hell's Kitchen, but this is what I looked like when I, I grew up in the restaurant business and um, my dad was a chef. He owned a bunch of restaurants over the years. He just retired a few years ago at 78 years old, still in the kitchen every day. Uh, but today's people first leadership for busy title agency managers. Uh, we're going to really focus on the people part of the business. Uh, but I was not a people first leader. I drove the business by the numbers. Uh, my personality style is a high pay setter, a driver, very top down, command and controlling. Um, I did not have regular meetings, quality meetings, regular quality one-on-ones. Um, I wasn't good at praising and recognizing people and giving people. The only feedback they got was me barking at people. And I really drove the business by the numbers. And you can, not surprisingly, you know, people couldn't keep up with me. I burned out people. I lost good people. I had turnover. So um, I had, a, first I had a good mentor and I had a like total makeover um, where I learned to take better care of myself, get some exercise on a regular basis, you know, bring my best self to the job every day because I was kind of a workaholic, sleep deprived maniac. And um, so I had more regular team meetings, more regular one-on-ones. I improved my quality, my communications. I was less emotionally volatile. I had to control my emotions, be more regulate, regulate myself, and, uh, and and really focus on growing people who in turn are going to grow the customer's base and who in turn are going to grow the business. So a little bit about my background and my um, uh, crazy kind of chef owner persona <laughs> that I had to reinvent myself. Uh, okay, Jeremy, enough about me. Uh, got a couple poll questions for you just to get your conversations in the game uh, today. There they are. What are your kind of top two people manager challenges? There they go. You can pick two and submit those, and we'll just have a quick report out here. Yeah, Could we'll you give, them a, give you all about you know ten ten more seconds. So let's uh, see how it's tracking here. Well, Steve, looks like uh, sixty percent. Hovering around 60% attracting growing, although now it's you know it's it's, it's moving around. I, I can't guess. It's like it's like the betting odds for the the, the Super Bowl this weekend. Uh, very fluid. Yeah, definitely. Well, attracting and growing and retaining uh, you know great people is, is still maintaining the first. So we'll go ahead and close it. Doesn't surprise me. Sure. Yeah, just, okay. Yeah, topping out at almost 60%. That doesn't surprise me. Second place, interplace work conflict. Yep. Uh, you'll appreciate, folks. I've, I'm working with a title agency leader right now, owner and their management team. They just implemented gossiping, got so bad at their agency um, locations um, that the the owner and the management team put in a. a, a, a we're, we're kind of moving ahead in the slides there, Jeremy, I think by accident. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. But they just, inter they just introduced a zero tolerance gossiping policy. You get one warning, one warning, and that's it. So they really put, they put the line in the sand, but it got so toxic because that underground communication is uh, really toxic and will undermine your environment. Um, Jeremy, do you have the poll results, that next slide? See what else we got on there. Oh, yes. Uh, you want those showed back again here? All right. Let me share them again. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. I just wanted to get that there. Yep. Poor communication, uh, low engagement, people doing the minimum, lack of next level leaders. So, yeah, that that many of these, of course, tied together, interdependent. Um, 
but we're going to be focusing on those things we can control today. And hopefully, wherever you fall on this list, that there's going to be some nugget or two, a takeaway day, something that you can pragmatically start applying right away. Um, today's workshop is supposed to be very pragmatic. That you can start having the right conversation with the right person or the right people at the right latitude to get the outcomes that you want. And we're going to be focusing on those controllables. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Um, next one. So we have to appreciate this uh, percentage. You know, uh, it's, it's pretty sobering reality. We know that people don't quit companies. They don't quit organizations. They quit managers. They quit us. They quit people. Of course, people move on for a lot of different reasons, life changes and different career options. But I think one thing we have to appreciate today is the outsized impact that we have on employee engagement. Employee engagement meaning that uh, above and beyond that minimum discretionary effort that people give to the job, you know, that real passion. Uh, I had a, my mentor said there's only two kinds of employees, fountains or drains. You know, fountains are those employees that come into the workplace and they shower the workplace with positivity and collaboration and, and esprit de corps of cooperation and just really customer service oriented, right? Just really fiercely customer oriented or drains. Those are the people that just kind of suck the energy out of your culture, right? Behind your back or right in front of you. Uh, those toxic in, in behaviors, you know, conflict, gossipy stuff. Um, um, but having said that, we have a really big in, impact on people's uh, engagement levels in the workplace. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. It's just those few core um, maybe capabilities and skill sets that we can all just lean into this year and um, bring a little more uh, intentionality and deliberateness, how we show up every day. Thanks, Jeremy. I've got a chat here. Uh, we've, um, we're in GoTo meeting, Jeremy. I don't know if people will need any coaching on the chat box on GoTo. Are they pretty literate, do you think? Maybe, but uh, let, let, let's do it. Why don't you pop in your uh, your answers there in the uh, chat box, and we'll, I'll funnel or any responses we get to you. Great. So, so uh, people, yeah, yeah, the people challenges we just talked about in the poll. What percent or what number of those? I think there was five. Do do we have influence over? There's, you know, thinking about the controllables versus the uncontrollables. We can't control the labor market. I get that. Just curious how how you're. It, it, it's all over the place. <laughs> yeah. What's our rank? I tell you what, people are are listening and paying attention. I can't even I can't even keep track. They're just rolling in quickly. <laughs> awesome. Keep it rolling and keep Jeremy on his toes. Right. Uh, well, thanks everyone for for popping in. So kind of range five hundred percent all. Yeah. Fifty yeah. percent. Yeah. What was the lowest number? Three. Oh, three out of the five? Yeah, three. I think it's three out of the five, right? Yeah. So yeah, you said what percent or number. So hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's kind of confusing. Yeah. So that, well, that made hopefully, it a little Yeah, hopefully everybody in, in just reflection right here today is leaning towards that, you know, highly controllable level, you know, that the majority of those we can't necessarily control the talent that's showing up to interview for your agency coming in the front door for a job um but once but appreciate that once they come to us and once we bring them in house um we bring them into our culture uh what are those things we're doing or not doing that um engages or disengages people you know right from the very interview i'm talking about the interview process what's the quality of your interviewing process do you have a quality good standardized interview process um, is it structured Do you have good process uh, to rule out those variants and, and get the best people possible and your onboarding onboarding is so darn important to build people's initial personal emotional connection pec i'll give you a quick do's and don't of onboarding uh, um, the research shows by most people when they're in their young 20s, most of us, our personalities are kind of baked, right? We're more introvert or more extrovert. We're more pessimistic. We're more optimistic. We're more open-minded. We're less open-minded. So, you know, we, we, our personality is kind of baked as a, as a young adult. 
However, there are times in your life when your psychology is open to thinking new ways and behaving in new ways. And one of those disorienting events in our life, um, and there's, there's several of those, but getting a new job, because you know how most people, how you feel when you get a new job, right? You're nervous, you're scared, you're fearful, you're wondering where you're going to fit in, you're going to be successful, is this a good place for me, will it be long-term jeopardy? You know, so there's a nervousness around it. So they're, they're kind of psychologically disoriented a little bit, but it's a rich time to build people's personal emotional connection with your agency, you know, the social part of it, relationships, your core values, your mission, and telling stories about the company. In other words, their first part of your onboarding experience should be emotional and social versus, and I just saw this the other day in an agency office, they walked me through their onboarding, showing people where to put their jacket, how to punch in, go through the employee handbook, you know, all the technical aspects of the job. No, 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 no. We, we'll get to all that stuff later. But have, you know, get buddy someone up with a buddy, have them walk around introducing people and making people feel warm so you kind of get it. So, you know, once people come to us, this program today, remember we have a 73% variance on people's engagement. We're going to look at those, the controllables that we have over. And I think most of those ones on the poll are, we have control over. Okay, Jeremy. You can pop the other one. So a little quote here, just to emphasize what we're up to today, is if you focus on the results, nothing changes in business. If you focus on the numbers, not much ever changes in the business. But if you focus on change, the results will change. And so we're really, this people first orientation is focusing on those core things that we can do on a daily basis, being deliberate about building people before building title products and solutions for our agencies. Okay, Jeremy. I wanna introduce you, there's one more, I think, one more uh, sentence there, uh, to this idea of servant leadership. This is kind of a philosophical concept for you today. Uh, this occurs when a leader or manager seeks to serve others first versus individuals who seek leadership because of power, status, or wealth considerations. Servant leadership is from a book coined in the 70s. It's been around a while. It's used by a lot of, lot of institute organizations as their core leadership development philosophy and training and coaching. Like Chick-fil-A uses it, American Express uses it, Apple uses it. So this idea of servant leadership has been around a long time. It has a very enduring quality to it. And I want to just get a little more practical what that looks like. Um, Jeremy, and you can tee up the next slide. So if you look on the left side, the hierarchy, typical top-down command and control leadership, right? The management is very much in control, very dictatorial, uh, you know, kind of one-way traffic. And you can see the value stream is at the bottom because the, the, cost, the employees are not very empowered. It's keep your head down low, do as I say, um, very transactional environment, not very empowering. And the value stream ends up, maybe we hope the customer gets good value. We hope they do. Um, but if not, you know, it's manager's job to fix it. And in top down, more hierarchical organizations and cultures, you have a lot of politicking. There's a lot of influencing up to the boss, you know, sucking up to the boss and you know, always looking to the boss for answers. And the management gets frustrated because no one takes any initiative. There's no ownership. There's no entrepreneurialism. And everyone is always coming to managers to fix problems. And managers complain that the employees don't show any ownership or initiative. Well, the servant leadership model, model flips that pyramid upside down. In the second part, it values the command and control. What's valuable about the traditional leadership model is leaders, the servant leadership part. The leadership part is setting clear direction for the people, setting clear standards and expectations. Are people clear in their expectations? Your vision, your mission, your core values. That's the, that's the important and critical part of traditional leadership, and that's the leadership part of servant, is providing people that direction clarity because in, employees need that. They want that. They want to make meaning and purpose out of the job. Now, once people are clear on that, then you've done your job as a leader. People are clear on where the company's going. Then you, then you invert the pyramid, and servant leadership shows up and says, how can I help you? How can I support you to be at your best? And this is where mentoring shows up and coaching shows up. And servant leadership isn't soft. It may sound soft, but this is where candid and honest feedback shows up. This is where people 
are clear that gossiping is not, not permitted in the workplace and things like that. So servant leadership is a very tough style, but it's very support and development. You can see that green arrow up there. So there's just a philosophy I'll just very roughly share with you today uh, that um, I, I'm a, I'm a cha big champion of. I think when leaders get those two parts right, people are clear and set in directions, and they also feel supported and cared for and um, encouraged and mentored and guided. I think those two dynamics in play with each other um, really create a, a healthy, vibrant, thriving uh, title agency. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, we got our second poll question here. What percentage of employees say their manager helps them set performance goals? Pick one. I think I uh, I think I botched it. I clicked the button. It, I didn't think it was going. I closed it already. Oh goodness. Oh, you did. Yeah. Uh, so why doesn't everyone? We'll just do a quick detour here. If you want to just uh, punch in your answer in the chat. Thank you, everyone, for being uh, <laughs> being Thanks. kind for my my failure. <laughs> well, you think after doing webinars for like a decade, you can handle this stuff. Good, good uh, adaption there, though, Jeremy. Switching the chat, it's all good. Well, I'll, I'll have to punch all the numbers into a, you know, Excel and get you. Ah, uh, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. See what they got. See what the I'll, survey. I'll, I'll share you. Um, looks like a lot of a lot of thirteens, some fifty fives, some thirty threes. Obviously, I don't have to break down. I don't see many seventy twos. In fact, I see. Oh, there's one. There's one. The rest are the. Um, Looks like we're in the 13, 33, and 55. Yeah, okay. A bunch of realists in the house tonight, today. There we go. All right, survey says, next slide, Jeremy. Yep, let me hide that here. Sorry about that, Steve. No worries, it's all good. We're, we're uh, next slide. Yep. You 13 percenters win. Yeah, so only 13% of employees strongly agree that their leaders Help them set performance goals, targets, results, and outcomes and expectations. Why is this important? Well, research is pretty clear on this. Um, uh, people that are employees that are more clear in expectations are higher engaged in the workplace. If you look at what are the top complaints of U.S. Ameri U.S. workers across industries, the I mean, money again, money off the table. If, if money's on the table, that's always going to stink and rot from the head down, but if you take money and compensation off the table, again, getting the things we, we have more con, uh, control over, is that people complain of uh, poor or no recognition, no career advancement, poor or no feedback in the workplace, poor leadership communication, but unclear expectations are usually in the top five of most employees' complaints. You're just not clear on what the expectations is for management. And when you set those performance goals per area, per department, and they're not always to, are not always easy to do. I'm, I'll just uh, acknowledge this. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, I couldn't even imagine how to set this for this person, this department. But keep this in mind. Everybody should have a number. I'll say that again. Everybody should have a number. I'll give you an example. In the restaurant business, um, the host station, host is host station, their number is two. What does two stand for? The phone should never ring um, more than two times before you picked up. So those critical kind of metrics are there. Um, so this is very important, setting expectations. How clear are your people on your expectations and performance goals? And when you do this in collaboration with the employees, it's a really powerful way to build trust and clarity in, in the title agency. So, so this could be an opportunity for you. And certainly research does suggest it's a, uh, a big opportunity for most of us managers out there. So this could be a conversation moving forward today. You make a commitment to having with people and it'll really move the needle in a lot of different ways. I can promise you that. Okay, Jeremy. And we're gonna move into feedback here, the important critical communication skill set. Uh, another kind of dismal or look glass half full, glass half empty. Let's say glass half full. What a big opportunity we have for increasing the quality of our feedback. And this includes recognition, of course, feedback is recognition. And uh, the percentages on Generation Z are also very high. You know, the these younger folks coming in the workplace, I've got two Gen Zers at home, uh, well, early in college, 
And, uh, you know, they've always been in the know. Jeremy and I were talking about the different parenting styles of our, our parents versus us. And, you know, our kids have been very included in the adult conversations and they're not used to top down command. And, and they really seek out leaders and managers and organizations that um, there's more transparency. Uh, there's more opportunity to have input on how work gets done because they and most employees really value autonomy. Autonomy is a big core driver of 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 of, of all employees, all humans. Um, people don't like to be controlled and told what to do. So improving that quality, that communication, that two-way flow, this has been a big stretch, certainly, uh, particularly for more seasoned managers like myself who've been around a while. I've had to really over communicate. So your one of your goals leaving here today, Jeremy and I talked about this earlier today. You should be an over communicator. I say there's this new role for leaders now in title agencies called the CRO, Chief Repeating Officer. You need to be the Chief Repeating Officer um, because again, one of the top disengagers of employers are leadership under communication, poor communication. So most managers and leaders would say there's a great opportunity for them here increasing feedback and clarity in the work environment. So there's a good odds are, and you may say, I, I say it all the time, people just roll their eyes at me, Steve, and I say, tough, that's that's your job. Just keep repeating. Yes, you should try to find different ways to tell the same message over and over. Tell some stories, sprinkle some stories in there and use some different platforms and mediums, not the same one. But uh, it says it takes at least seven times, seven times for a leader to communicate a dominant message before people uh, hear it, internalize it, reflect on it, and change their behavior in accordance with their expectations. So there's, remember, keep that seven times in your brain. Because you know a lot of managers will say, well, I told them at the meeting, or I sent out an email. She, I'm, I'm telling you, you got six more to go. You're under communicating. Okay, Jeremy. Yeah, Nat uh, Steve, Natasha chatted, yeah, the, the chief reminding officer. Oh. oh, I said repeating, yeah, reminding officer. Yeah, th thank you, thank you for that. Okay, here's a little pop quiz for you. I want you to write down. Uh, this was a study the Army did on um, uh, 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 in a, an exercise, a competition into their special ops, which is the Green Berets. They took four, no, no, they took this group of, these are uh, Army graduates. They graduated from boot camp and were candidates for the special ops group. So these were highly motivated, physically fit, uh, top of the class, these are all A players, and they, so they divide them into four groups. The groups are all equal in terms of uh, motivation and physical fitness and so forth. And they had this race they had to do. So the group that got over the finish line first um, would win and be a, considered to be a candidate for the Green Berets. The only difference, the groups weren't, weren't able to see each other or talk to each other. The only difference was the information they were told. Each group was told something different along the race course. Group one was told the exact distance, 20 kilometers. I think which is 12.5 miles of march and they received regular feedback on their progress group two is told you're going to march 15 kilometers today but at 14k they were told they have six to go so group two actually had to go 21 kilometers so a kilometer further than group one group three was just told this is the long march you heard about <laughs> and never received any feedback in their progress and group four was told you're going to march 25 clicks today but at 14 they were told you only have six to go so they actually, group four, only had to go 19 kilometers. So based on that information, write down on a little sticky note or piece of paper, which group came in first place, second place, third place, and fourth place, meaning the whole group crossed the finish line in the fastest time, 12 point K. Think about that a second. The other thing they were measuring was stress hormones in the body. They're also measuring the presence of two stress hormone indicators, cortisol and prolactin, to see which group had the highest stress levels as well in the bloodstream. Okay, Jeremy, that's all the time they get. Next slide, we'll come back to this. I'm gonna give it to you right away. So, um, feedback. I want to give you a, a way to organize your feedback in a way that's super um, organized for yourself and for the employee. And it's called BIG Feedback. BIG is an acronym for Behavior, Impact, and Going Forward. 
and um, plus the setup. I want to just give you a, a, an immediate tool, script, way to organize information that's going to be useful for you and for the employee. Um, let's say you've got to give somebody some um, developmental feedback. By the way, I'm going to pause here. I think there's only two types of feedback. Um, positive, that's the stuff we, that's praise, recognition, right? The stuff we love giving and people, most people love receiving. So that's a positive feedback. The second feedback, let's call that developmental. Let's not call it negative. Then you create a false binary, positive and negative, and we don't want to create that. So get rid of negative feedback, get rid of critical feedback, get rid of constructive feedback, although we want feedback to be constructive. I like positive or developmental. I like developmental because it, it's a mindset that I'm, I want to I want to help this person get better. I want the feedback to be useful. I want them to be successful at our agency. So it creates more of a mindset in the manager coach mind um, that um, we we want to grow this person on the job. So hopefully that's useful to you, positive or developmental feedback. And I think there's these there's two parts in blue here to set up feedback to minimize defensiveness. Uh, then people receiving the feedback. One is you can ask a permission question. Hey, uh, Sherry, do you have a few minutes to talk about your team collaboration efforts? Now, some managers will say, Steve, well, what if they say no? <laughs> it happens so rarely in few times that people have said no. I kind of laugh a little bit. I shouldn't laugh, I know. But um, I ask them why, why? Because I've got some important feedback. I'm gonna give it to you. Is now not a good time? Is there something going on? So I'll just be curious why, why I can't give you this feedback but I'm gonna give them the feedback. Sometimes I'll say, uh, well, if you can't, if I can't give it to you right now, how about tomorrow morning at nine? And they'll usually say, no, let's just do it right now, get it out of the way. And some people say, well, see, that's kind of manipulative. You know, you're asking for permission and they should be able to say no. So it technically, I guess it is a little bit, but I do find if you have a trust, if you don't have a trusting relationship with this person, right, these conversations are hard and just catawank, catawampy. Right, so trust is everything. You know, we start with building trust in our relationships. Leadership is a relationship, um, and so no. I just want to be clear: the disclaimer is no communication technique or skill you're going to learn here today or anywhere is going to compensate for a low trust relationship, and you know that to be true. So asking a permission question is it shows professional respect. It gets them into the game with you. It signals it's more of a partnering, collaborative conversation. And so it, it's a good it's a good technique. It does really work well. And then I like to provide a little balance in the feedback. Some people like to do the old feedback sandwich, give something positive, you know, that's the bread, then give them the negative, that's the zinger, the burger in the middle, and then finish with a slice of bread on the other side. And uh, a lot of managers call that the old crap sandwich um, because employees kind of feel like it's a technique being done to them a little bit. So if you learn that, just you know, just be sincere and authentic with it. But I tend to not do that but i do like to provide balance and it could sound like this hey sherry 90 percent of your work is that of a very high quality it's just this one area that you need to strengthen so when people hear some balance that this isn't the way they always are it's just this one area or it's a small percentage that can help minimize and lower defensiveness because it doesn't feel like it's just this big crater coming on top of them so those are just two suggestions for you as a way to enter into these conversations and lower defensiveness and build up rapport, trust, and safety. So the B of the behavior um, can sound like this. I've noticed you doing the basics of your job by not helping out your peers. Give examples. So in the behavior of the big model managers, facts are your friends, right? Facts are our friends in these conversations. So we wanna have good concrete examples as much as possible. Impact, uh, you know, in the impact of this, it's hurting team morale and collaboration. Uh, our workflow task coordination is suffering, which is you know, ultimately hurting the customer experience. Going forward, can we talk about what's going on and come up with a plan for moving forward? The reason this big um, framework works really well, let's go from the employees or the re person receiving this. It provides context. It provides specificity. It helps connect the dots between their behavior, the business, the customer, the team, and it's as accountability built in at the back end going forward because we are we are requesting a behavior change make no bones about it and that last move you can see um the last move can be an ask or a tell hey starting monday morning i need you to start so you can just tell them monday morning i need you to stop gossiping do i have your agreement right it's not an ask it's a tell much of management right we have to decide is it an ask or a tell 
So you can tell, it depends on the person, depends on the situation, depends on this is the first time I'm talking to them or the third time I'm talking to them. But uh, the, the way I've got it here, I got it set up as a really a collaborative uh, dialogue. Can we talk about what's going on, you know, so that we word in here is partnership, we not me, and come up with a plan for moving forward. You can see it's you know, prov provides some clarity and there's going to be actionables going forward. So you got to move there to me. By the way, the big feedback, um, you can use it for giving people the, so this is developmental feedback, right? There's a gap between where they currently are and what you need them to be. So we're, we're always addressing that gap there in developmental feedback. But you can use the big feedback model for the positive stuff too. And it could just sound like this. Um, hey, hey, Jeremy, I've noticed that um, these webinars, I'm just making this up right now, by the way. <laughs> hey, Jeremy, uh, I noticed that the webinars that you show up really super prepared. Uh, you set planning meetings in advance. There's clear criteria for what you expect for having a quality webinar, and your facilitation is really is really um, it's it's fun and tight and strong. The impact of that, Jeremy, is I think it creates a really rich learning experience for the Alta memberships. Um, it uh, I think it represents the value that Alta brings to the organization, and I think it builds good goodwill for people to come back, good customer Alta loyalty. Hey, going forward, Jeremy, can you just keep up the great work? So you can see I can that big, oh, you're welcome. Yeah, th thanks, Steve. That was a, a good feedback, and I will definitely work on my poll sharing skills to improve the you know, experience. Yeah, that's, that's a whole other conversation we have to have, but uh, yeah. <laughs> good, um, I had to give you some positive strokes today, my friend. Um, so um, make, a, make a distinction here, folks, between praise, and praise is your superpower. I'm telling you right now, managers, leaders out there, Praise is probably your underused superpower. Atta boys, atta girls, thank you for a great job today. I appreciate you. Um, and we may be under praising the workplace. Is catching people doing it right. Um, this should be something you leave here today for 2021. Really focus. It's the most simple, inexpensive thing you can do to build morale, engagement, and fun in the workplace is praising people. But uh, I want you to acknowledge that praise is not feedback. So you say, I give Steve, I give feedback all the time, uh, but you might just be giving a lot of praise. And you can see feedback has a lot more what? Information in there. So the big feedback framework is just a model for you to maybe organize feedback. It's, it's a way to organize your thoughts in a way that's super constructive, keeps the conversation safe and mutually beneficial. And also it's very useful for the team member because it provides that clarity, certainty, and context and helps connect the dots very well for people. So for your consideration, a tool leaving here today. Okay, Jeremy, we can move on. So uh, you thought you were just gonna sit here and watch PowerPoint slides say, uh-uh, I got some work for you. You got some homework. I want you to think of a current or past employee situation and I want you to write out a big feedback script in the chat box. I just want you to work this muscle set right now, folks. Um, get used to giving good specific examples, get used to, and uh, have a couple impact statements in there and get used to con closing these conversations with actions and accountability, because we're this is all about behavioral change here. So I'm gonna sit back, Jeremy's gonna sit back, I want you to just work a little bit here. And work as well. The other advantage is you'll be able to see your colleagues in the chat box, and these are really rich, you know, and I always learn so much from reading others as well, because you'll, you'll, you'll steal other people's language the big framework might not have been language you would use like mine, so make it work for yourself. But it's great learning, uh, collaborative learning exercise for all of us. So take a couple minutes here. This may be something you're gonna leave right here today and set up a conversation with one of your team members tomorrow to have this conversation that's been overdue. And remember, it can be positive or developmental, but still I want you using the big. Well, Steve, as, as we're talking about this, that may actually maybe think about the user experience and, and what people can actually see. I don't know if any everyone out there can actually see everyone when they submit the uh, oh. comments. So what I'll do, if people are, no one's submitted kind of a, um, a big feedback script yet, but if they do, and there are some, I'll compile them in a, uh, in a, in a Word document. I'll include that as a, as a download to the follow-up email. Oh, that's nice. Okay. So 
Well, should I just give them a few more seconds here if people are writing? Yeah, and you know what? I mean, that maybe it, maybe it's a lot to take in to think about a scenario where someone actually they did say they're they're dealing dealing with 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 a situation with now. Um, so Kimberly, maybe you know if we can't do it now, I mean, want to email it to me. Um, sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good. We'll we'll move forward. Um, but I, one thing I want you to appreciate, folks. This this exercise I'm having you do right here, writing out your big feedback. This is the type of preparation you should be doing for these um, heavier conversations or more meaningful conversations. In other words, you don't want to be winging these important feedback conversations because rookies wing it, pros plan, and you want to be a pro. But just appreciate this is the type of discipline for giving these people, and particularly if you're gonna have a difficult workplace conversation, you can anticipate high emotions, high disagreeability, maybe some of them might, you think they might quit on you, those crucial workplace conversations. These conversations, this is the type of planning that you should do to make sure, and, and most of the time, if you plan really well and you have a good emotional headspace, they go a lot better than we think they're going to do. They really do, I think 80% of the time, they go pretty well. You probably, Hey yeah. Steve, yeah, we got a couple that came in. So um, nice, concise ones. So I think that works well with right now. So uh, one from Sandy, I've noticed that you have been showing up late. This um, imp impacts us as an office when we are not all here on time and ready to work. Going forward, can you please work on your time management and communicate with me if you're running late? Round of applause, give a round of applause. That was That was great. Was that Sandy, Jeremy? Yeah, yes, yes. And so folks appreciate about Sandy's big statement. How long did that feedback take, Jeremy? How long did that? 10 seconds, 15 yeah. seconds? Yeah. So we're in other words, we're taking the excuse off the table is you don't have time to provide people with quality feedback. Sandy just knocked it out of the park in 15 minutes. 15 seconds. Great. You got another one there? Well, yeah, I have got two more here if you don't mind. Um so this one's from Sarah. Uh by not taking the extra time and paying attention to the details, you are causing issues with other, whoa, okay, sorry, a bunch of people popped in here, lost here, just a second, let me get back up there. Okay. You are causing issues with other customers on this transaction and departments. How am I able to help you so you, you are not continuing to make the same mistakes? So, uh, you know, identifying the issue and then offering help to improve their behavior, right? Yeah, and with the issues, you just want to make sure you give you have a couple concrete examples so they know what you're talking about. But that's another really great big feedback model. Well done, thank you. How about one more? All right, and this one's from Kimberly. Um, border it, it kind of she's talking about a, a employee borderline insubordination, disrespect. However, she said her reaction was not appropriate at the time. She followed with an email stating, you know that. Uh, that apology for the way apologizing for the way she reacted and that they needed to get together to, to discuss the incident oh so kimberly was apologizing for her reaction correct oh well first of all I applaud you kimberly for being transparent and honest and that's going to happen right we're, we're not we're, we're never going to do this perfect so have some self-compassion on, on ourselves and i think when we do owe someone an apology do what kimberly does just apologize and move on just apologize and move on. Um, yep. Excellent. Those are three great ones, right? Yeah, they're they're actually the people are getting their juices flowing now. So, like I said, we could probably you know spend another ten minutes on these, but I'll, I'll compile these in a word document and I'll add them, and you guys can kind of see the scenarios, and hopefully it'll, maybe it'll help you help everyone else. You know, if they have a situation on how to you know handle something, and Steve, you'll get it too as well. <laughs> That's great, thank you, Jeremy. I I love learning from other people's scripts that they use, and I hopefully you value that as well. So thank you, Jeremy. That I think that'd be a great resource to print out and laminate by your computer. <laughs> okay, we'll move on. I want to make sure we have some time for Q and A. So this is really our objective, folks. Right here today is smaller, sooner conversations are better than larger, later conversations. Because if you take those difficult workplace conversations, those ones that you've avoided having, not the ones that are one-off egregious behaviors, but you know the ones that we've tolerated over the years, because we say in management, you get what you model and what you tolerate. The behavior that we've tolerated, we haven't been proactive, we've buried our head in the sand, we've avoided the conversation. Um, 
I think, you know, 80, 90% of those can be maybe not eliminated, but largely mitigated if we proactively move in quicker and give people big feedback and hold people accountable to our standards and expectations. So I, I would really encourage you this year to create a culture, a feedback rich environment culture where people are getting a lot of information. Once people start getting a lot of information, um, they just get used to it. Right now, they might not be used to it in your culture. They don't get a lot of feedback. If that's the case, hey, just start where you are and just start giving people more feedback. And I'll give you a six week feedback diet plan and challenge I wanna give you all right now. For the next six weeks, I want you to give as many of your employees as possible big feedback using the big framework, positive feedback using the big framework. So supplement your praising with big positive feedback. That will get you working that big muscle set. You'll get used to organizing feedback in that framework and it'll get your people used to getting more information. They'll, they'll probably look at you a little bit like, what's going on here? Um, and uh, that way, when you have to give people a little bit more of that developmental feedback, they're already used to getting a lot of rich information. So we're kind of training ourselves and training our people to give and receive more useful, constructive uh, information. There's your six feet, six week feedback diet challenge for you guys all right jeremy i think we're getting close oh okay uh you can drop in the chat box your which group took first second third and fourth place i'm going to give you a countdown here oh you can just drop in the chat box I, i'm kind of zooming they're rolling in oh overwhelming majority are saying one and a, a smattering of four. Okay, all right. Let's show what survey says, next slide. Yep. Those of you got group one, yeah, the group that was told the exact distance and received regular feedback, yep, they took first place. Second place went to the group, they had an extra kilometer to go. They actually went 21 kilometers and they took second place. Why is that? Well, what the theory is, remember, Remember what this what this population is super motivated, super fit, super smart, super determined. And so the theory is, you know, what do high performers do when you give them a challenge? They rate they find a way to win, right? High performers find a way to win because they're drivers, they're competitors. So that's the theory there. Last place, group three, told the long march, never received feedback on their progress. No big surprise there. Uh, although Group three had to only go 19 kilometers, but they came into third place. And the theory is there, they kind of maybe let down their guard a little bit. They're like, oh, we got only 19 kilometers ago. We can, you know, we can take the foot off the gas pedal a little bit there. But they're obviously in, in the groups, no surprise, which group had the highest levels of stress hormones? Group three. This is the long march and never received feedback in the progress. They had the high levels of cortisol and prolactin and group one had the smallest levels. So think about the implications for you and managing your people and culture at your agency. The, 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 what this does, the benefit of quality, frequent, substantive feedback, um, it helps people be at their best. They're gonna work more, they're gonna be smarter. They're gonna be more engaged. They're gonna be less stressful. Work environments where, there's, where people are under communicating, there's not a lot of quality feedback. Um, it's gonna cause stress for people. People are not gonna be at their cognitive best. They're gonna be underperforming. So a uh, fun little feedback quiz. Thank you for just playing along here and hopefully you got some insights there. And Jeremy, I think we can go to next slide. Real quick, difference between coaching and feedback. Well, majority of millennials rate professional or career growth and development opportunities as important to them in a job. So again, finding, engaging and keeping great people, your best thing to do is to start focusing on your culture creating a, a high growth coaching development culture. Culture. If you don't have a career pathway of advancement and growth opportunities, that's something maybe you should work on as a priority in 2022. I work with many agencies in that area. But you're gonna attract like bees to honey when your agency gets the reputation of growth, development, advancement. Again, money off the table. Hopefully you're paying people competitively and fair, but it's a huge attractor for the cream of the crop. So just really appreciate that managers out there, you should probably be maybe coaching a little bit more, maybe managing less. Next, Jeremy. Real quick, we'll punch through these. So coaching versus feedback. Feedback is pretty much one way. 
coaching is, is collaboration, it's two-way. The team members should be doing most of the talking. Coaches, we ask great questions, we're great listeners, we're very solution-oriented, we're encouraging, supportive, and still, just like a feedback conversation, a coaching conversation, which typically happens in one-on-ones, um, still you end up with accountability actions and next steps. Who's doing what by when? That's my favorite thing from measuring actions. Who's going to do what by when? So just a quick drive through the difference between coaching and feedback. Coaching, we say management is something we do to people. Coaching is something we do with people. Coaching is much more of a two-way dialogue about what people are passionate about how we can help them be more engaged in the job, more successful. And we show up as coach, very supportive there. Um, and finally, Jeremy, here's uh, just creating the cadence of communications, some things to think about going forward, this goal of over-communicating, daily check-ins with people, you know, really letting people know you care about them and how they're doing and getting to know people, weekly team meetings, daily huddles or lineups, monthly one-on-ones, quarterly town halls, annual team retreats. Those are just examples of creating a cadence of quality, predictable information so your people are clear, um, feel engaged, feel passionate about working through your agency. But we have to create these types of communication structures for that to happen for your consideration. Uh, okay, Jeremy. And finally, 78% of U.S. employees say that being recognized motivates them at their job. Again, your six-week feedback, positive feedback diet, creating a culture of high positivity, support, and praise. So it's the deepest thing you can do leaving here today. There's one thing I suggest you do. Just start doing a lot of this, and you'll really, I think, see the impact in your environment. Um, and we're going to open this up to Q&A right now. Happy to take uh, you. I don't know if they're able to come off mute, Jeremy, or is this all chat? It's all chat. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we kind of always manage manage it this way. Otherwise, if people get off, then it kind of gets background or someone doesn't mute their line. Um, so yeah, we will have a little time. We're almost at the top of the hour, but you know, if you want to have any questions for Steve, uh, submit them. <laughs> Tanya, question is, what happened to John the skier when he went left? Well, I went back there and I looked under this place. He had dropped down about four feet into waist deep powder. We were in first place and I, he was petrified. He was really terrified. And I, of course, I felt like terrible. I felt so bad. I had to dig him out. And as we're digging him out, we were in the lead. And I heard the group of skiers, the, the pack, pass us. And I was so disappointed. I just thought I ruined his career because he's trained for two years for this moment in time to make the national team. We ended up winning by 12 seconds. Woo! We came back. Very nice. Good question. Good question. John came back and you guys still won. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I had to buy the beers that night. Trust me. All right. Uh, in case others have a question, Alex asked if they're re being recorded. Yes, you'll get an email with a link to the recording tomorrow. Um, Kimberly's question about legal input may have to consult your attorney or something like that. Steve, I don't know if you're an attorney. I'm definitely not. So I can't offer any guidance on how you can handle specific situations or, um, you know, what you can and can't do best practices for, you know, handling any tricky issues. Any guidance for that? Any, any places, any resources where people may be able to go? Yes, um, great, great question. And just for distinction, our conversation today about coaching and feedback, we are still in this lane of growth, development. We believe the person can be successful here. Once you move over into the lane of HR process where you're going to implement a performance improvement plan or any sort of legal or liable documentation, you need HR consultation on that. Your area should, I know in our area we have a lot of uh, HR consultants, fractionalized HRs that will consult with you and partner with you, uh, both lawyers and legal teams. So I just do a little research in your area and, and get some good consultation there because you, and it's a great question because if you don't have good HR policies and processes at your agency, you should create those. And that's a little bit outside my, I work with a lot of HR professionals, but I'm not HR or legally certified. All right. Uh Great question, and, and Steve, thanks for the, the input. Uh, Marlene says, uh, yeah, she has a wonderful HR consultant, and uh, she's in Orlando, Florida. 
Oh um, yeah, good for you. Yeah. A um, couple of questions about just you know, the industry's been super busy the past two years. You know, you got COVID and then it's just crazy busy, nonstop. So how, as a, a leader, a manager, how do you how do you hit the pause button and and you know try and give that feedback when your staff is just like doing whatever they can to keep you know getting deals closed? You know, how do you how do you find that moment of time? Kind of a related question is, you know, the majority of our membership are are, are small businesses, you know, less than 10 employees. So as maybe as a secondary question, how do you have an annual retreat, you know, and shut down your business for a day? <laughs> well, uh, my answer is going to be pretty trite and probably not as sophisticated as you'd like, but I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you there are uh, a lot of agencies out there, small mom and pop sizes up to larger ones that I've just had exposure over the last 11 years, that they do it. I mean, they it, it, it's sacred. They, they consider, for example, one-on-ones, regular one-on-ones, uh, team meetings, town halls. They just really view it as an investment. They use an investment in the business. It's not a cost. It's not something they have to do. It, they just It's a mindset about the belief in building a, a long-term sustainable business and they view some of these practices and structures. Uh, I, I'm working with an agency last week and um, they they shut down uh, one last Friday of every month, they shut down the day at 3.30 or four in the afternoon and just have a team social hour because the leader just sees it so vital to, to rebuild the connection, pay attention to the culture, and making sure people are having a little break from things. So it's at the risk of a little chunk of business at the end of a Friday, sure. Uh, but it's a, you know, opportunity cost folks are very real. Um, and so we just have to be, I think, inten intentional, deliberate, and conscious about the pace of the business and the quality of the business. Um, yep. Yeah, yeah, great insight. Uh, if we didn't get your question or, you know, something else comes to mind, uh, you know, afterward, uh, Steve's email is there on the screen. It's in the slide deck that you'll get. Um, Steve, again, thanks sir, for the insight on uh, communication. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Appreciate you, all the members. Yeah. Again, just a reminder is, is webinar it is recorded. You'll get a link to the, to the recording tomorrow. Um, you can always find our archive on Alta's website, alta.org forward slash webinars. Uh, before wrapping up, I do need to thank SoftPro once again for sponsoring today's webinar. So thank you, SoftPro. And with that, uh, that will bring us to the conclusion of today's presentation. Uh, Steve, thank you again. This was a very enjoyable, interactive. Hopefully everyone uh, enjoyed uh, providing the, the feedback and any, or the comments and the feedback from you. Um, with that, uh, take care, everyone. Thank you, Jeremy. Bye-bye, everybody.